And so I think the first thing this does is it gives you a roadmap that, hey, these are the areas where we need to focus our future research opportunities. This is what we need to be looking at. The second thing um, they did was uh, they said that we need better guidelines, right? We need to know what's safe and what's not. And it has to be a little bit more clear cut than what they're stating right now. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Andrew Pucker. I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Medical Science at Lexitas Pharma Services, and I'd like to welcome you back to the In Focus podcast series. Today, I'm here joined with our expert, Dr. Shaw. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Sheetal Shaw, and I'm a cornea and external disease specialist and the director of the dry eye clinic at Gainesville Eye Clinic. And I'm part of the TFOS lifestyle epidemic um, workshop, and I'm here to talk to you about a few of its findings. Perfect. I'm actually also on the Public Awareness Committee from TFOS, and that's why we're bringing you this installment. Specifically today, we'd like to discuss the impact of cosmetics on the ocular surface section of the Lifestyle Report. Um, Dr. Shaw, could you please just give us a little overview of the paper? Why should we, why should we care about it? So just to start off with, you know, TFOS stands for the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. And it's a nonprofit organization whose basic aim is to promote eye health education. And since its conception, TFOS has stimulated numerous international research efforts, amongst its achievements being the famous dues reports, which have revolutionized the way dry eye disease is classified and managed today. But today we're here to talk about their most recent collaboration called the Lifestyle Epidemic Ocular Surface Disease. And this report talks about the effect of everyday lifestyle choices and issues on the overall health of the ocular surface. In my opinion, making it the most relevant study they have published thus far. And several different topics were researched to determine their exact impact on the ocular surface. But in this podcast, we're going to be focusing specifically on the role of cosmetics in dry eye disease. That's great. I totally agree. TFOS has changed how we practice. We now have a definition for dry eye. We now have a definition from for digital eye strain, which is in this actually, you know, series of papers. So uh, with that, um, I think that this paper specifically pioneers what's good and bad about cosmetics yes. around the world. So could you kind of just explain how cosmetic regulations in the United States may differ from other parts such as, you know, Europe? Yes. So, you know, one of the things this paper focused on heavily was the regulation of cosmetic products across the world. For example, Canada and the EU have stricter regulations than the United States. And this means that the United States may allow some questionable ingredients or the amount that's allowed within the cosmetic product. And it can differ from the EU, which they may deem to this to be harmful while the US does not. So these products then can contribute negatively to the ocular surface by directly affecting the tear film, causing allergic or contact dermatitis around the eye. And theoretically, because they contain carcinogens and tumor promoters, it can also play a role in malignant lesions. I think it's pretty startling what what is allowed in the United States. Yeah. So if you look at the containers, you might even see something like formaldehyde, right? You yeah. know, the stuff we involve people with when they pass. Like it really makes you think, and it I think we need to get our patients to start to look at some of these bottles to see what they're getting into. Exactly. And I think it's it's the ingredients, but it's all the, the amount of ingredients that are allowed. And it's interesting how in one country that's considered harmful, but in another country that's acceptable. So there's just like a huge difference in opinion. Yeah, there's safety is. For sure, like something like what a thousand products are banned in the UK and right. Europe and it's like 11 in the United States. Exactly, <laughs> makes you think. Yeah, um, kind of related to this, uh, the report discusses something called the clean beauty movement. Could you explain that for us? Right. So the clean beauty movement is an attempt to make cosmetic products around the world safe. However, as it's trying to do that, it is suggesting that 
amongst the different regions of the world, there's a huge discrepancy that there are certain areas that are prohibiting ingredients or certain amounts of ingredients while others are not. So it's hard to have a uniform clean beauty movement when there's a huge discrepancy already between what different countries are allowing. But yeah. even more, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, it's just like, yeah. like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think what was important was um, they further went on to say it's something called um, the GMP or the good manufacturing practice. And they did find in this report that there was um, more consistency when um, they were practicing GMP. And what GMP attempts to do is it ensures that a product is prepared in a clean and healthy environment because you don't want contaminants in beauty products that are going to be applied to your face and then to your eye. And especially because these contaminants can be very harmful to human use, leading to infections and potentially even stuff that causes cancer. And on top of that, they do have um, an international organization, it's called ICCR, and its main thing is to protect consumers, which is important, right? Um, and it does this because it allows different countries to kind of talk about what they think it's safe. And so I think that's a very important um, step that they're doing in the cosmetic industry is having more regulation. It sounds like we've made some progress, but there's a long ways to go. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Yeah, so kind of with that, what does TFOS suggest going forward? What should we be doing, you know, with our patients, explaining to them, you know, right. what products to choose, all those sort of things? Right. And I think that's where this becomes tricky because probably the most important take home point of this paper um, for me was that through all this research that they evaluated, they found that they need more specific, better quality, and larger sample size studies to determine exactly how certain products are affecting dry eye disease. And so I think the first thing this does is it gives you a roadmap that, hey, these are the areas where we need to focus our future research opportunities. This is what we need to be looking at. The second thing um, they did was uh, they said that we need better guidelines, right? We need to know what's safe and what's not, and it has to be a little bit more clear cut than what they're stating right now. The third thing that they mentioned in this paper, which I thought was really interesting, was that there needs to be more sharing of data publicly for adverse effects. And it needs to be shared between different countries as well. And though they're making strides in this particular um, field, they need more oversight of the eye makeup industry. And there needs to be more accountability there as well. And the last is, you know, we're suggesting that a lot of these ingredients that they're using are harmful well, what's a better substitution? What's a safer substitution, right? If we can't use these ingredients, what can we use? And that needs to be backed by research as well. So I think that's another area that we can kind of focus our future efforts on. Yeah, I think that's an important point. People, men and women are not gonna give up their cosmetics. They're not gonna give up their face cleaners. Right. So we need to have suitable substitutes to meet people's needs. Right. Yeah. So. Kind of with that, is there any other like little take home nuggets that we could give our audience to take back to clinic or their lab? Yes. And so I think as like doctors, um, it's it's hard, right? Because we want to make our patients aware of these issues, but patients also need to take it upon themselves to be fully informed when they buy something. That it's important to look at the ingredients. It's important to look at where it comes from. It's important to look at if it was related to any adverse effects. And physician-driven management of dry eye disease is only part of it. But if this TFOS paper has shown us anything, is that patients are making decisions that are directly impacting the outcome of their ocular surface disease and their symptoms. Perfect. I love those take-home messages. So <laughs> with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Shaw for helping us out today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to the In Focus podcast series. I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.